Good morning, guys. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for coming out early and being a part of all that we're doing here at One Thing. I wanted to stop at the beginning and just say thank you for uh, your thoughts and your prayers about my mom who uh, passed away. I was here two weeks ago in this spot teaching on Can I Trust My Bible, part two, and uh, shared with you about her condition. She passed away at 4.03 that afternoon and uh, went home to, to be with Jesus and to be with my dad and my brother and her mom and dad. And so it was a, a reason to rejoice. I was privileged to be able to be there to see both my dad and my mom take their very last breath. And I count that a real privilege uh, to be able to have been by their bedside in those, uh, those moments to see them step across the threshold of faith and finish well. And that's uh, what we want to do here through One Thing for Men. We want to help men to finish well. And we do that by spurring men on to a passionate pursuit and a walk with God. So if you have a Bible with you this morning or your device, whatever it is that you use, I want you to turn to two different passages of Scripture this morning. The first one we're going to look at and spend some time on is Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 is where we will be first of all. And then I also want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. We're going to be in a lot of other places this morning. Uh, but those are the two places where we're going to land most of all throughout our time together today. I also want to encourage you to take out a piece of paper. Maybe you could use your table notes or you're going deeper. And I want to ask you to do me a favor. And I want you to write down the answer to this question. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to write down the answer to this question. It's a vitally important question. Write down your answer. You're going to probably want to come back to it in a few moments when we uh, do our around the table discussion. But the question that I want you to answer in 30 seconds or less is, the, is this question. Who is Jesus? That's your question. 30 seconds. Begin now. Who is Jesus? <clears throat> All right, 30 seconds is up. Hopefully you wrote out a whole doctoral dissertation there, or at least a letter or two that's discernible that you can come back and think on later on. But uh, keep that because I have one other thing when we come back at the end of our study together that I want you to write down as well. So keep that pencil or pen, lipstick, mascara, whatever it is you have available to write down the answer to that question. Now, who is Jesus? There is not a more relevant question that could ever be asked in all of human history, but especially today. And the answer to that question is absolutely important, absolutely positively essential that you settle the answer to that question. And if truth were known, there is no shortage of answers to that question in our world today. For instance, the, Jew, the Jewish faith believes that Jesus was a, was a great teacher. He was a very good man. He was a, perhaps a rabbi or maybe even considered a prophet. Uh, Islam believes that, that Jesus uh, was one of Allah's many prophets of whom Muhammad was the greatest. The Mormons believe that Jesus was a good man who worked his way up to becoming a God just like you or I could do. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was a, a good man. He was, he was the first of all created beings in the universe and, and uh, he was uh, vitally important to the plan of God. Eastern mystics believe that Jesus was an enlightened soul, a guru, if you will, a, a person who obtained nirvana. Nirvana. Uh, humanists believe that Jesus was a great moral philosopher and teacher. Uh, the Unitarians believe that Jesus was a nice guy who helped people go through a really tough time in this life. And so there's no shortages of answers to the question, who is Jesus? But you and I got to settle the answer to that question, who is Jesus Christ? Well, what's interesting about all of those lists of belief systems that I mentioned is this. They all believe in Jesus' existence. They believe that Jesus was a good man. He was a good moral teacher. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, Hutch, that's a pretty good start, isn't it? They at least had some idea of, of who he was and that he was a good man, maybe even a great man, a great teacher. Well, the fact is, is that that definition falls woefully short of what the Bible says of who Jesus 
was. You see, all of those different world religions have one common denominator. They deny what the Bible says about who Jesus was. The Bible says that Jesus was Jehovah God wrapped up in human flesh. Very, very different than believing he was a good teacher, a moral leader, a philosopher. He was Jehovah God wrapped up in human flesh. You see, all of biblical Christianity rises and falls on the identity of Jesus Christ. Now, what is interesting is this. The Bible claims something of Jesus that is absolutely positively unique to him. Never has there been another, never will there be another just like Jesus. And that is this. The Bible claims that Jesus had a dual nature, two natures. First of all, the Bible teaches us that Jesus was fully 100% human. And we understand that because as we read through the gospels, we see that he was hungry, that he got tired, that he was thirsty, that he needed sleep, that he felt pain, that he dealt with temptation, that he understood disappointment and experienced grief. All of those very same things, each and every one of us as human beings go through in this thing called life. As a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, chapter four and verse 15, we read these words. It says, for we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was 100% human. He could relate to you. He could relate to me. He could relate to every single one of us because he was one of us. He was 100% human. But the Bible also teaches, claims for us, that Jesus was also fully God. Fully man, fully God. It doesn't teach us that he was 50% man and 50% God, but that he was fully 100% man and fully 100% God. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, Hutch, I think you're stretching it a little bit. What did Jesus believe about himself? Well, that's a great question. And that takes us over to Matthew chapter 22. But before we get there, look real quick at what this Philippians passage says. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So here the Apostle Paul is teaching us that Jesus humbled himself and he stepped out of heaven, wrapped up in human flesh, born of a virgin, scripture tells us, 100% human. Now, we come to Matthew chapter 22. And in Matthew chapter 22, we're going to begin reading in verse 41. So we've established the fact Jesus was fully human. Now we want to establish the teaching that Jesus was fully divine and he understood this about himself. Matthew 22 and verse 41 says this. Now, now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. They were always peppering Jesus with questions, always trying to trick him, always trying to get him to paint himself into a corner. But here Jesus asks them a question. And he asked this question. He says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And immediately... Without hesitation, without delay, without taking even an instant to stop and think. These religious teachers, these rabbis immediately answered, they said to him, the son of David. Now that's interesting because in 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse, or in chapter 7, uh, Samuel, there was a prediction that the son of David would be the Messiah. In other words, the, the Messiah would come through the lineage of David. Isaiah chapter 11 repeats that teaching, that the son of David, the line and lineage of David, would produce the Messiah. Now, 
we're getting ready to come up on Palm Sunday. And do you remember what took place on Palm Sunday? We read about it over in Matthew chapter 21. And in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus makes his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. He's riding on a donkey that had never been ridden before, and he's coming into town. Only this time, his entrance into the city was significantly different than at any other point in time that he had walked into the city. For this time, he's riding on a donkey, but what they are doing is they're waving palm branches. They're laying down their coats and their cloaks on the ground so that the donkey could walk across it as in a triumphal entry into the city. And they sing to him these words, Hosanna to the Son of of David. Now that's important for you and I to understand because we don't fully grasp all of the Jewish mindset and tradition. In a Jew's way of thinking, the words and the terminology, the son of David, was synonymous with the Messiah. So when you said the son of David, you were talking about the Messiah. So they were singing to Jesus, Hosanna to the Messiah. They recognized who he was. They're singing his praises. Think about this. This is Palm Sunday. We know what happened later on in the week, right? We'll talk about that at another time. But here he is. Jesus goes on. How is it then that David in the spirit? You remember we talked about that when we were talking about the inspiration of scripture. In the spirit. He's referring here to Psalm chapter 110. It's a messianic psalm in which the psalmist is writing about the future Messiah. And it says, in the spirit. Remember what 2 Peter 1 and verse 21 says? It says, no interpretation of scripture came through man's will. But men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is referring to here. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit... Uh, David, is, uh, the psalmist is writing Psalm 110. He goes on, he says this. How is it then that in the spirit, David calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? So he's asking a very thought provoking question that day. Now I got a thought provoking question for you. How many of you in this place are fathers? Let me see your hands. All right, grandfathers, let me see your hands. All right, most everybody in here is either a father or a grandfather, and there's some younger guys that haven't been married very long, maybe not married at all yet, but in all likelihood, one day you will be a dad. How many of you dads, how many of you grandfathers call your children or your grandchildren Lord? Yes, Lord, whatever you want, Lord, whatever you say, Lord, pizza every meal, Lord. That may be what they think of themselves, but hopefully you have a household in which you can straighten them out. And so that's what Jesus is trying to help us to understand here. How is it that David would say to his son, he's teaching a principle here. What I love is verse 46 of Matthew 22. No one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. He shut him up. Well, the answer, of course, we know is this dual nature. The human part of Jesus was in the direct line and lineage of David. To the Jewish way of thinking, the lineage and your genealogy was very, very important. And if Jesus had not been a part of the line and lineage of David, everyone would have known that and they would have stopped him in his tracks, but he was. But more than that, <clears throat> he says David used a word in Hebrew and it was the word Adon, which means God, which means Lord. And David said to his Lord. So he's teaching here that Jesus had both a human nature and a divine nature. John 1 and verse 1, very familiar passage of scripture. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Paul called Jesus in Titus 2 and verse 13, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8 calls Jesus the Almighty. 
That was a term exclusively used to refer to God. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, For in him, that is in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. <clears throat> John 14. I love this interchange that took place in John chapter 14. Listen to this. Philip, one of the disciples, said to him, that is Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Here's Philip who's been following Jesus, listening to every word, watching every miracle, a part of all that Jesus was doing. Jesus, would you just do this one thing for us? Would you just give us a nanosecond glimpse of the Father, and then that'll settle everything. It'll be okay. And listen to what Jesus says to Philip. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus said, when you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. Because we are one in the same. Yes, Jesus did make that claim of himself. Now, let me give you real quick five proofs of Jesus's divinity. Real fast, razor light. You got to write this down, okay? Shorthand, whatever it takes. Get this stuff down. Number one, Jesus had power over disease and sickness. Jesus had power over disease and sickness. Jesus was always healing disease, always healing sickness. In John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who had been born blind. And in verse 32 of that text, John chapter 9, that man said this in response to Jesus' healing. Listen to what he said. He said, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. This man was born blind. He never saw, he never saw shadowy figures. He never saw brilliant colors. He never saw the face of his mother or the face of his father. And then as an adult, Jesus comes along, heals him, and immediately he receives sight. Jesus had power over sickness and disease. Secondly, Jesus had power over nature. You remember in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus and the disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee. All of a sudden, a storm comes up. The disciples are in fear for their life. Jesus is taking a nap. They wake him up and they say, Jesus, don't you even care about us? We're about to perish. We're about to die. Jesus gets up, simply says words something like this, peace, be still. And immediately, think about that. If you've ever been to the water's edge, if you've ever been to the ocean, if you've ever seen a river, it doesn't do anything immediately, but immediately the water was like glass and the wind ceased. And listen to what the disciples said in verse 27. To each other, can you see the dynamic of this moment? What sort of a man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Jesus one day is walking along. He's hungry. He sees a fig tree. He looks down. There's no figs on the tree. He curses the tree. The tree dies immediately. It doesn't have a slow browning process. The disciples happened to walk by that same spot. They were there with him when he cursed the fig tree. The next day they come by, the tree is dead and gone. He had power over nature. Thirdly, Jesus had power over demons. Jesus was quite often casting out demons. Demons would literally shudder in his presence. And so after an experience of casting out a demon, we have this little interchange that takes place. And Jesus is teaching in Luke chapter 11, verse 21. And Jesus helps them to understand who he is a little bit. Because they're questioning, the religious leaders are questioning him. And he says in verse 21 of Luke 11, he says, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when a stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he had trusted and divides up the spoil. Jesus said, I can cast out demons because I am greater than demons. 
I have power and authority over the demonic world. And when I say get out, they get out and they go into a herd of swine and the swine goes and jumps over the side of the cliff. When I say come out, they don't hesitate. They do what I say. Jesus had power over disease and sickness. He had power over nature. He had power over demons. Number four, he had power over sin. Power over sin. In, Math, in Mark chapter 2, it's one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. Jesus is in the city of Capernaum, and he's in a house, and he's teaching. As was his custom, and as is the custom of rabbis, he was sitting down, and he was teaching. Because Jesus was in town, and because Jesus was teaching, the house was absolutely packed. There was not an empty chair to be had anywhere. There were no aisles. There was no room. It was jam-packed wall-to-wall, floor-to-ceiling people with crowds standing outside of the door. Well, there are four guys who have a dear friend who has been paralyzed from birth. He's never experienced what it was like to walk. He's never experienced what it was like to skip. He's never experienced what it was like to run. He's never experienced what it was like to dance. He's been paralyzed since birth. And so these four friends have such a burden, they think to themselves, we've seen Jesus heal. If we could just get him to Jesus, I know Jesus could heal him. So here are four guys carrying a stretcher, one on each corner, and they're bringing their friend to this house in Capernaum because they've heard that Jesus is there and he's teaching. And as in all good church services, they tried to excuse their way through to the front, but they couldn't get in because everybody was more self-absorbed and concerned about their own being there and listening to Jesus, right? You understand what I'm saying, right? So here they are. They're trying to get, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, uh, we need to get our friend to Jesus. And they just kind of get a little closer and a little tighter so that they couldn't go this way. It's kind of like you drive on 400. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, you see this guy coming up, you slide over in his lane just to slow him down just because you can. And so, obviously, by your laughter, you've done that, okay? And so, here these guys are, they're trying to get in, and they can't get in. They go to the windows, they go to the doors, they try, maybe we could throw them over there. It just ain't going to work. All of a sudden, they get this great idea, and one of them says, wait a second, I've got a chainsaw back at the house. Let me go and get it. So he runs home, goes through his shed. He gets his steel chainsaw. He comes out. He walks up the steps to the top of the house on the roof. And he starts cutting a hole in the ceiling in the roof of the man's house. Jesus is teaching. He hears this noise, specks of dirt and, 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 and of, of plant product starts to fall down in front of him. These guys are serious, aren't they? I mean, they went the extra mile, cut a hole to get their friend to Jesus in the roof of some other man's house. And they lower him down. Jesus is sitting there. And he looks at the guy. And I love this. This is is such a cool thing. You've got to look at it if you've never looked at it before. This is amazing. Jesus looks at him and says, Son... Your sins are forgiven. I think about that for just a second. Is that why those four guys did all that they did? Eh, maybe there was something in the back of their mind. But to be honest with you, they wanted him to be healed. And that's exactly what he did. Jesus said, not only are your sins forgiven, but here's the deal. Pick up your mat and... Walk on out of here. I'm getting a little older, and sometimes I'm sitting in a chair that's a little shorter or smaller than than I would prefer. And and I got to be honest with you, I need some help to get up. I got this swing. My wife wanted this swing. She loves this swing. It's sitting on my front porch. You come to my house, you sit on this swing. It takes me 10 minutes to get out of this swing. I mean, I'm sitting low, I'm sitting back, I'm trying to push in, the chain moves, finally get out of the thing. And so, I'm saying all that to say this. As hard as it was for that guy to get in, I bet you he walked out of there and it split wide open like a a ripe watermelon and he walked right on out. He got up and he walked. Let me ask you a question. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or is it easier to say take up your mat and walk? 
Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Why is that? Because you never know if it actually happened, do you? There's no measurable, tangible, fleshly way to know if that has indeed taken place. But here's what Jesus did. Jesus took care of his spiritual problem and Jesus took care of his physical problem. And he demonstrated that he could do the easier, he could do the harder by doing the easier. Wait a second, he, you know what I'm saying. He did the hard thing. He said, take up your bed and walk. Because Jesus had power over sin. He had power over demons. He had power over nature. He had power over disease and sickness. And there is one more, but I'm not going to tell you what it is till we come back after we have sat around the tables and had our discussion about who is Jesus. God bless you. Let's break to the tables. We'll be back in a few minutes. Grab that uh, piece of paper and that pen. Here's the second thing I want you to write down today. Warren Wearsby. This is a quote by Warren Wearsby, great Bible teacher, pastor, communicator. And Warren Wearsby says this, it is impossible to be right with God and wrong about Jesus. Write that down. It is impossible to be right with God and wrong about Jesus. Just keep that in mind, guys. Okay, we've been on this journey and we've been talking about the proofs of Jesus' divinity and we spent a few moments talking about the fact that he has power over disease and sickness. He has power over nature. He has power over demons. He has power over sin. Number five. Part of the proofs of Jesus' divinity is this, is that he had power over death. Power over death. Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, talking about Jesus, says this, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. He has power over death. To walk out of the grave. You know what would have been the easiest thing in the world to do? If it was possible. Would to have been to squelch Christianity right after Jesus' resurrection. All you had to do was produce a body and a logical excuse and explanation of what had taken place. And it would have been dead in its tracks. But they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. It couldn't be done. And that's a proof of Jesus' divinity. Now go back to Philippians chapter 2. And I want to read the rest of that portion of scripture. We began by reading verses 5 and 6 and 7. Let's read verses 8 through 11. And look at what it says. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, today we look at a cross and we see it as a, as a piece of jewelry. In Jesus' day, they didn't wear crosses as jewelry. It'd be the equivalent of, wear, of us today wearing a piece of jewelry with an electric chair on it. It was a form of capital punishment. It was a form of shame. It was a form of, of, of just horribleness. 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because of, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I, I know what some of us are thinking this morning. We're thinking to yourselves, you know what, Hutch, I, I appreciate the little Bible study. I appreciate the lessons. But to be honest with you, this is a bridge that I crossed a long time ago. There was a day when I was a teenager. There was a day when I was a kid. There was a day when I was a 31-year-old, and I was lost. And somebody shared with me that Jesus loved me and that he gave his life on Calvary's cross, and he rose again from the grave. And if I would accept him as my Savior, I could have eternal and abundant life. And I stepped across that threshold of faith. That's the testimony of many of us here today. And if it's not your testimony today, understand this. God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to be wrapped up in human flesh, to walk on this sin-cursed earth, to live a perfect and a sinless life, to die a substitutionary and atoning death on Calvary's cross and to rise up from the grave for you. To bridge the gap between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man stands the cross of Jesus Christ, whereby we get from our sinfulness to his holiness. And it's the only way. Jesus stepping out of heaven and into earth and onto earth was the only way to bridge the gap, to satisfactorily pay the price, the debt that we owed that we could not pay. So if you're here today and you've never done that, our prayer is, is that you would give your life to Jesus and just simply say yes to him. Stop trying. Stop trying to earn your way there. Stop trying to work your way there and just simply trust that Jesus was who he said he was and that he did what he said he came to do. So maybe you've crossed that threshold of faith, but let me talk to you for a second. Maybe you've got that settled. But there's a, um, there's a quote on your card. Let me see real quick. By Hudson Taylor. And listen to what he said. He said, Jesus Christ is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. Now, maybe you're not like me. And that's a real possibility. I have been called odd before. But there's some things in my life that I struggle with. And there's some days that I don't always do what I'm supposed to do. And maybe I'm 95% committed to the lordship of Jesus in my life. But the truth of the matter is, is that's not good enough. Because God says, I want to be 100% Lord. You say, I don't understand what you mean. Well, just think about some of the things that we do in the everydayness of our life. The words we say. The language we use. The stories we tell. The way we drive. The way we make money. The way we spend money. It's tax season, the way we fill out our taxes and the temptation to fudge just a little bit here and just a little bit there. After all, the government's got plenty already, all right? And we wrestle with these things. We, we wrestle with the phone ringing and yelling across the room, tell him I'm not here. What's up with that? So every day in small ways, the lordship of Christ is, is put to the test in my life. Do I walk humbly? Do I walk proudly? Do I salute the driver who absolutely, for some odd reason, has to be connected to my bumper? I don't understand that. But if I could, I would. We see it displayed in our world all over the place. You're on a business trip and you're by yourself and the allure of the TV says the adult channels nobody will know. Where does your mind go when you have a few free moments? What do you pick up to look at? What apps do you go to on your phone or when you sit down at your computer? 
You see? 95, 96, 97, 98, 99% lordship is not enough. God says, I want to be Lord over your eyes and over your tongue and over your hands and over your heart and over your actions and over every area of your life. So maybe today, if you're anything like me, you need to come back and understand Jesus is either Lord of all or in reality, he's not Lord at all. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Do you know him as your Lord? That's how he wants us to live our lives. Can I pray for us? Father in heaven, we, um, we come to uh, the end of our time together today. And, and Lord, there is no way we could unfold all of the biblical truth on the human and the divine nature of Jesus in just one hour. But yet perhaps we have been encouraged today to do a little bit of study on our own and to be able to settle the issue of whether or not Jesus is indeed who he said he is, the God-man, fully man and fully God. To be quite honest, our finite minds cannot put all of our hands around the infinite. If we could, then we would be equal to or greater than the infinite. So there's some things that we don't fully understand, but by faith we accept. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us today to grow. For that gentleman that's here that has never stepped across the threshold of faith, given his life to Jesus Christ, I pray that the next step, the next decision he makes would be a conversation with that person who invited him here today, with that person who is a table leader, with that person who is a significant force in their life, that we would have the honor and privilege of showing them from the pages of your word how they can do just that. And then for those of us here who have been seasoned for a while, maybe we've been a follower of Christ for a week, a month, a year, a decade, or 50 or more years, or anywhere in between. I pray that you would help us to, on the moment-by-moment -moment decisions that we make, the reactions that we have, the things we say, the things we do, that we would demonstrate the lordship of Jesus Christ over every area of our life. And help us to grow in that in victory, we pray. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. God bless you. I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Thanks.